Hi, I'm Luna, and today I'm going to be talking about um, disability and representation in the media, and I'm specifically going to cover um, what overstimulation is um, and how it's represented in the HBO film Temple Grandin which is a biopic of a really well-known autism awareness advocate who is also autistic, um, Temple Grandin. And I think <laughs> it's probably best to um, start off with the disclaimer or just let you guys know that I'm also neurodivergent. Um, I was diagnosed with combined presentation ADHD uh, in about August of 2022. Yes. So about less than a year ago. And um, it was really interesting process because the fact that I have ADHD also meant that the uh, paperwork assessments that they mailed home to me sat in my room for about six months before I got around to it. So um, I'm glad to have an official diagnosis now. Having a concrete explanation for why I function differently has um, also allowed me to work on self-acceptance and being able to not only acknowledge that how I move through the world and experience the world um, is not only different from neurotypical people, but that it's okay. And um, I'm still learning different coping strategies and ways in which to improve my lived experience. We're gonna start off with a formal definition of overstimulation, um, which is also known as sensory overload it's basically like you're getting more input from your five senses than your brain can sort through and process, such as multiple conversations going on in one room, um, flashing overhead lights, or a loud party can all produce the symptoms of sensory overload. Anyone can experience sensory overload and triggers are different for different people. Sensory overload is associated with several L other health conditions, including autism, sensory processing disorder, PTSD, and fibromyalgia. Some symptoms include difficulty focusing due to competing sensory input. So if someone's talking to me and we're in like a really loud cafeteria, I'm probably not going to be focused entirely on the words that they're saying because not only do I have auditory processing issues, shout out subtitles, uh, they're lifesavers, um, but also the sensory overload. So it can kind of make me feel anxious and overwhelmed. So while someone is talking to me, all of that sensation is coming in. So I can't entirely focus on what they're saying. It's important to surround yourself with people who can understand that, but also you yourself being able to um, communicate your needs and um, kind of advocate for yourself instead of being overly apologetic. You can just mention like, hey, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Um, so that may be why it seems like I'm not paying attention, but I do care. Just so 
that people who may not understand what you're going through can still kind of empathize with you because they understand you're not just being an asshole who's not paying attention. Um, ADHD tangent right there, but yes. Other symptoms can be extreme irritability, restlessness and discomfort, urge to cover your ears or shield your eyes from sensory input. I do that all the time in public and um, feeling overly excited or wound up, stress, fear, or anxiety about your surroundings and higher levels than usual of sensitivity to textures, fabrics, clothing tags, or other things that may rub against the skin. So that information was from healthline.com and I think that it's a good brief introduction to what sensory overload is. So you know how on film sets that uh, they have those film reels and you uh, say take one <laughs> action and stuff like that um, for my purposes. I'm going to be holding up this uh, little fidget toy um, every time I'm about to start a new video that I'm reacting to um, just for my editing. So if you see me put this up, that's why. But tangent, um, this is my fidget toy and I actually got one for myself after working in a sped classroom and um it it kind of provides a distraction for when i'm feeling understimulated and i need to do something with my body um there are times i'm like bouncing in my chair or shaking my legs and stuff and it took a really long time to become aware of the fact that I had lived most of my life through masking, which is basically like conforming to these ableist societal norms of how you have to behave in public spaces. And that compounded with anxiety, um, you know, it was really hard for me to deal with. So after I got my diagnosis and after I worked with um, kids on the spectrum, you know, I kind of granted myself more leeway with being able to use my coping strategies in public and, you know, not feel so embarrassed or ashamed about it. Chris, are you paying attention? Yeah, absolutely. What did I just say? You said we were up 2% last week. Well, what are you playing with? Oh, these things. Well, I'm not playing with them. I mean, I am, but it's not what you think. Sometimes when I'm in an environment where I'm kind of understimulated and I need to pay attention, my mind can get restless and it starts to wander and I start concentrating on something else and then I really wouldn't be listening. Is that another ADHD thing? When I have something like this, it allows me to stimulate my brain a little bit more and it means that I can actually pay attention more effectively. So I did hear everything you said. That makes zero sense. My brain makes zero sense in the normal world. Um, this clip is from the documentary made by PBS, um, the public broadcasting station, and it is called Spectrum, A Story of the Mind. This is the intro clip, and I'm going to play it for you while I'm also watching.
Autism and sensory issues often go together. Almost everybody with autism has some degree of sensory issues. My sensory issues have always been auditory and touch. When I was little, I couldn't tolerate uh, being hugged. It felt like a tidal wave of stimulation washing over me. Then gradually, I got to where I could tolerate, you know, hugging. That's been desensitized, but I still have problems with scratchy clothes. The worst sounds when I was a child were balloons popping, school bell ringing, and firecrackers, things like that, really sudden loud noises. It was like a real pain down my ear. It really hurt. But the people have described maybe a sound of um, rain on a tin roof would just sound, one, one boy described that as bullets because it was so loud that it hurt his ears. There are other individuals that have visual sensitivity problems. They can see the flicker of fluorescent lights. You know, and it's flashing on and off like a strobe light. There's some people where the hearing and the visual systems are just giving them a jumble of information. So, you know, riding in a car might be like, sort of like looking through a kaleidoscope of things where hearing's cutting in and out like a bad cell phone. The visual system's pixelating and breaking up like a satellite disk is shaking. And so you really are concentrating on what the, the vibration of the car and what it feels like, because that's still giving you accurate information. And these problems are not in the eye. You can go check the eye out, the eye doctor, that's all fine. See, in the back of your brain, there's circuits for shape, color, motion, and texture. And those circuits have to work together to form a graphics file. Sensory issues are on a continuum. They can vary from little nuisances to being absolutely, totally debilitating. And it's one of the areas in autism that really needs to be researched. I'd put it on the top of my research agenda. So that was like the first few minutes of this documentary and um, I thought the animation was really nice and um, definitely could relate to some things. Um, a really good <laughs> clip from the Temple Grandin film is the scene where she experiences the sensory overload in the school cafeteria and I remember um, for the screening in, you know, the James Bridges Theater, I had to cover my ears <laughs> because it was overstimulating. Um, and I definitely could relate to it. I actually actively avoid going to the dining halls because of how overstimulating it can be. So. I tend to go to the food trucks and get takeout um, or something in the middle, which is like the study, which is uh, takeout and also a study space where people sit down, but I can't even study in there just because there's just so much stimulus going on. Um, but yes. next clip, I'm going to show you guys the cafeteria scene. So that is not proper my safety. Someone's gonna get their finger chopped off. I've never seen someone in the kitchen chop carrots like that. I, I only eat jello and yogurt. I, I, only, I only eat jello and yogurt. Is it cleaning?
So next we're going to talk about ways of self-soothing um, or preventative measures that one can take to avoid sensory overload. Um, my ways of self-soothing, um, one of them is kind of related to the deep pressure therapy that you can see um, from Temple Grandin and her pressure machine. Um, I like my weighted blanket. This is, I think, 15 pounds, but it's very comforting. Um, it's kind of like a big hug and A lot of uh, neurodivergent people do utilize deep pressure therapy. Like there's uh, compression sheets, weighted vests, uh, other things as well. And another way that I navigate through the world and have to be intentional about preparing myself for overstimulating environments is that um, I'll carry around earplugs on my keys. Um, these ones specifically I bought for using at concerts and they kind of help filter out like different frequencies of sound. Um, but still allow me to hear the music without, you know, the bass absolutely blasting my eardrums. But it's actually super helpful too for places like the dining hall where um, if I'm with people, I don't necessarily want like the full coverage <laughs> earplugs, like those thick foam ones where everything is blocked out. Um, another way that I avoid sensory overload is with lighting. Um, lighting is a huge, huge thing with neurodivergent people. Um, in the animation we saw, um, you know, they kind of showed it a little bit through the... I guess kind of fantastical point because like those wavy lines it's not what I see it's just that the light is overstimulating so um the dorms come with this absolutely horrific overpowering overhead light and even having it on produces this like buzzing noise that I can't stand. So not only is the light really harsh, but the noise is super bothersome. So Quiet! Turn off that light! Turn off that light! Ah! This, this, it's just, it's, it's not ideal. It's not comfy. It's too, it's too much. Um, so I put up like these LED strip lights and I also have like a single lamp on my tallest shelf of my desk um, and I can also adjust the brightness on that as well as the colors. Coping methods look different for everyone because different things affect different people. Um, but light is definitely a huge thing that I'm sensitive to. Um, for this next bit, we're gonna look at this clip from an interview with Temple Grandin and she's going to be talking about different ways that parents can help their children or, you know, if they work with children, um, tips on how to help them deal with sensory overload. So we're gonna 
watch that clip really quick. Could you talk a little bit about no, some of the challenges that um, educators might face and maybe address some of the, the things that they can do specifically to help uh, provide an environment that helps autistic children learn? Well, a lot of kids have problems with sensory oversensitivity. Some of these kids might be labeled autism, they might be labeled sensory processing disorder, ADHD, or some other label, loud sounds like the school bell, smoke alarm, just all the echoing noises in the gym or the cafeteria. These things are extremely variable, from just a nuisance to um, uh, you know, really debilitating. So you might let the kid wear headphones in the cafeteria to block out that sound, but don't let them wear them all the time because they'll make the ear more sensitive. Sometimes you can desensitize those problems if the child initiates the sound. One of the worst ones is microphone feedback. <coughs> so you'd give them the wireless mic, let him walk up to the speaker, goes, eh, and then he can back off, where he is controlling the amount of the stimulus. Another principle is, even though the child is not deaf and passes a hearing test, he may not be hearing auditory detail, so slow down when you talk. So if you say cup, say cup, uh, slow down, talk more slowly so that he can hear you. I remember a hugely frustrating experience I had when I was five in kindergarten. And we had a little workbook where I had to put down all the pictures that began with B as in beautiful. And I marked the suitcase picture for B as in bag. And they didn't give me time to explain that in our house they were called bags. Also, for uh, to help desensitize, there's a great paper you can get online. It's called Environmental Enrichment is a, an Effective Treatment for Autism. And what you do in this is you carefully stimulate two different senses, like maybe smell and touch at the same time, and you constantly change these stimuli. And you can use regular household things. You may hit a $30 paywall when you look for this paper. It's worth it. Again, it's environmental enrichment is an effective treatment for autism. I want to make it very clear this does not replace other methods. It's an adjunct. If you've got a three-year-old that's not talking, the most important thing you can do is 20 hours a week of one-to-one -one intensive teaching with that child. The worst thing you can do is to do nothing. Um, I just want to say that in terms of her advice and just seeking advice in general, is just to take everything with a grain of salt. Um, I feel like because Temple is such a huge figurehead for autism awareness that people take her word as, you know, truth rather than just another perspective. Um, I think a lot of parents with neurodivergent kids honestly just learn a lot through trial and error as well as obviously researching a lot of different methods. Um, not everything is going to work for everyone and I thought that this would be a good segue to kind of talk about sensory overload in the environment of ele elementary schools. Um, I was a special education instructional aide from, let's see, 2021 to 2022, I was assigned to a classroom. We had pre-K, kinder, and first graders. This was in a relatively middle class um, neighborhood, a nicer part of Irvine. So my experience working there is interesting because they had the resources. Um, they had the staffing to help support our neurodivergent kids. There were me and two other aides um, in the classroom as well as our lead teacher. And at uh, some point we also had um, a teacher who was doing her shadowing training thing, her hours. Um, so sometimes we'd have like five adults in there and it's about 10 to 12 kids. Um, so it was well supported, but that is not 
a universal truth, um, especially in lower income areas, even in terms of like equipment that was available. Um, but I wanted to spend some time talking about the different equipment that is available out there to kind of help soothe children. Um, for example, they have these weighted vests that's kind of similar to what the effect of this weighted blanket has. It's just like that pressure. That's kind of like a hug, a deep pressure. Um, they have those. And also in our classroom, we had like mini weighted blankets. So it wasn't like a full size one like this, but just something that fit on their lap. And um, another thing that I saw was these sensory pods. And it's kind of similar in providing like a tight enclosure. It's not necessarily claustrophobic, but it's more of like a hug. <laughs> and um, we had something similar to this. We actually had a whole classroom that was our sensory room and there was like a whole bunch of this kind of stuff in there there were um like these sensory tiles that kind of have like uh oil and water and like colored dyes so that when you step on it it kind of changes texture and color um we had this kind of like light corner and you could sit in it and it had this little mirror and you could change the colors. We had the sensory pod, we had a trampoline, uh, we had I think like the ball rockers and one equipment that I saw online that was super interesting was this autism steamroller because it looks a lot like the pressure machine that Tempo Grandin made. We also had a bunch of mini fidgets, like little, little square ones like this big, and we can just hand it to them um, while it's like carpet time or kind of as incentive for doing schoolwork. So they would rotate between three different tables and there were our stations and we had one aid at each station and they would spend about two to five minutes at each station and um, we would put up these little digital timers so that, like the kids can see and be prepared for you know those transitionary periods because that's a huge thing for people um, who are on the spectrum like you can't just yank them and put them in a new space they kind of need a heads up like they need to know like what to expect next I learned a lot not only about autism but also recognizing the ways in which I related to them and it was really eye-opening and was actually part of what pushed me to follow through with getting my diagnosis because I guess being exposed to that environment was like a form of representation in itself because I had spent most of my life not necessarily knowingly interacting with um, disabled communities and being in that space allowed me to 
gain more understanding and awareness of how everyone is affected differently, but also that everyone deserves to be seen and understood. And by seeing and understanding those kids, it kind of granted me more self-compassion, I guess, whereas it wasn't necessarily that I was ashamed of being different. Sometimes it was that, but it was also that I just didn't recognize it. Um, yeah, so representation is super important. It's really important when disability is represented in the media for it to be done in ways where we're not further, further harming the populations that are supposed to be represented. So while it is important to raise awareness um, it can be done in wrong ways. For example, uh, the film I Am Sam and the fact that the disabled character was played by a non-disabled person and the stereotypes in that film left a legacy, I guess I would say. Um, so representation is important for awareness and also destigmatizing disabilities that aren't immediately visible or recognizable. So I feel like a lot of public empathy is granted towards people who are visibly disabled, for example, um, people who are born with like congenital deformities or, you know, someone who may use a wheelchair or may be missing a limb. Those things are easily, more easily recognizable on sight, but for someone who maybe has like lupus or other chronic illnesses um, or even ADHD, um, I feel like there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of destigmatizing those as well as active work from the neurotypical community to be able to recognize neurodivergent tendencies and also being able to accommodate for those things and not make people feel like they don't belong. For me, the Temple Grandin film was so relatable and um, validating, especially being able to relate to her with the things like sensory overload um, or sometimes difficulty in social situations. But for me, that stems more from social anxiety than I guess lack of understanding social cues. Um, there's definitely stigma that I faced within my own family and mental illness or mental disorders in itself is kind of this huge taboo thing in Asian cultures, which is super unfortunate because my family <laughs> are, uh, they're struggling. Um, 
they're victims of the Cambodian genocide and they actually immigrated to America in the 80s and um, because of the war their upbringing had a lot of adverse childhood experiences and you know those developmentally are not good for you so there have uh, relatives who have schizophrenia bipolar disorder depression but because of the stigma they didn't seek proper help and I guess I'm kind of like the cycle breaker because I actively seek help for all of my issues whether that be my major depressive disorder or my ADHD um, and it took a long time for me to not care as much about how they perceive me because the end game is for me to lead a happy healthy life and I can't take care of them they're grown adults and I've had my think pieces I've put in my two cents here and there and how they choose to deal with that is their own choice maybe that's the medical model of disability uh, <laughs> making me feel like there needs to be a cure that it has to be treated but when it actively affects my family members as well as the loved ones around them it's kind of hard to not um especially if it's like another manic phase that could have been easily managed if they had just been regularly taking their medication and this is like the third time they've gone off their meds it's kind of hard to not uh buy into that model <laughs> um but yeah so i, I guess yeah, because I grew up in that environment, um, there was a lot of stigma towards myself, if that makes sense. Um, just impacted my ability to seek help, and I wasn't able to get a professional, professional diagnosis of major depression even though I had dealt with it all of through high school, I couldn't get it until I had my own health insurance, the student health insurance, and went to CAPS and, you know, was able to talk to professionals. There's also a huge learning curve as well because I was diagnosed as an adult with ADHD. Um, in terms of learning and utilizing coping methods rather than feeling embarrassed or ashamed so I used to feel more of a need to mask my symptoms and to present as normal but as I got older I kind of had more compassion for myself and, you know, accepted that if I am too overwhelmed in an environment, it's okay to step out. And there's nothing wrong with me utilizing this in public. I might be looked at weird because this is typically like a child's toy. That's another thing. Um, we'll talk about that later in the section about TikToks, but there needs to be more 
products available for adults that, I don't know, aren't just children's toys, but, um, yeah, let's see. I want to play this clip since we were talking about elementary schools. Nice to meet you. I'm Red. We we didn't mean to scare you. Wait, did she just go inside that couch? Yep. But why? Maybe she doesn't like loud sounds. Kind of like Ben. You're right, Brad. The thing that was really good is it explained a lot of things about autism Temple. to children. And I thought that was really good. Sensory issues, um, the uh, making friends, uh, making friends with shared interests. That's something I've often talked about. That's how I made friends. Temple, that's not how you fly kite. Try the way we're doing it. No, thank you. Everyone always wants me to do things their way. But I like doing things my way. And each different kind of mind uh, brings different skills to the table, and these uh, different thinkers can be complementary. I think things like this show will be really good on uh, educating elementary school kids about, you know, differences and inclusion. I think that's really good. What is Temple doing? So I think that having more media like that is really important just for kids to understand why other kids may be different than them and by introducing them to that at a young age I think it gives them an enhanced ability to recognize signs of neurodiversity in others and also grant them higher levels of empathy because if you truly understand why someone is behaving the way that they are, then you can kind of put yourself in their shoes and be like, yeah, I can see why this really loud classroom or this really loud music, you know, was bothering this person rather than looking at them in a othering kind of way. Um, and I think that's also interesting to talk about neuro neurodiversity in schools because I feel like While it is better now, bullying, especially before, I guess like 2010, um, tended to gravitate towards neurodivergent people. And um, these bullies just like didn't understand maybe like this autistic person who is socially awkward and different from their peers and um, a lot of people like that who may not even themselves knew they were neuro neurodivergent but these bullies definitely <laughs> I think for the most part didn't know and I think it's shifted over time and there's definitely still stigma there but I think schools have gotten better about bullying at least the ones that I've seen and just the general consensus I think a lot of it has transitioned to online bullying or cyberbullying, um, 
rather than like, hey, give me your lunch money kind of thing. But I still just last year saw, saw um, stigma and a lack of understanding towards my neurodivergent students, not only from their peers, but also from teachers. Um, for example, we had integration time where our kids would like after recess go into another classroom and participate in their calendar time and depending on you know each student's IEP there were some that I pulled out for uh, math time and they had their math lessons with the general ed classroom and um, when my student would display kind of more neurodivergent behaviors such as rocking or verbally stimming um, some students kind of ignored it other people looked annoyed um, one teacher always looked annoyed, whereas another one was like super understanding. So I think that we've definitely come a long way, but there's still more work to be done. And one thing at our school that I thought was super great was our best buddies program. So I think it was once a month, something like that, but this is equivalent to like six period, but towards the end of the day, um, our kids would go into the auditorium and they would be paired up with another peer who wasn't in a sped classroom and there were typically older students spending time with our neurodivergent students. Um, they would do things like arts and crafts and I think that was a great way for these kids in gen ed classrooms to not only be exposed to people who are different from them but also be able to cultivate this sense of like empathy and um understanding and I definitely think we need more spaces like that where there is an active effort to bridge that gap. I think that's how <laughs> I think that's how you'd say it. Um but yeah, I think that representation is super important just to feel seen and understood um, and to have characters on screen who you can honestly relate to and, you know, people who aren't caricatures or the butt of the joke. Um, one of my favorite characters, um, I don't, the show didn't officially say that he was neurodivergent, but just based on what I saw, um, he did have disassociative identity disorder but he also displayed like touch sensitivity um, he didn't like to be touched and he struggled with like social cues and social interactions um this is from the show mr robot and the main character is elliot alderson and 
He's like a very, very intense computer hacker. I, <laughs> but watching it, I always felt like I understood him and I felt understood. Dude, I really feel like I'm resonating with this character. Which one? The autistic one? Yeah, yeah, the autistic one. And I think it's, um, it's important to have healthy representations of neurodivergent people in the media. And um, I think another good example is this character from the show Rami. Um, this character isn't, isn't like playing into those stereotypes mentioned in the Code of the Freaks where they're like, are, um, uh, awe-inspiring or, you know, pitiful. This person, Steve, um, he was born with muscular dystrophy and he's kind of like the comedic relief but he's a flawed human and um I think it's really good to have more disabled actors in the media you finally have a Muslim on a TV show that's not a terrorist you have a person with a disability that's actually played by someone with a disability and they don't just want to kill themselves or feel sorry for themselves. We're just telling our own stories. This week on Between You and Me, I sit down with actor and comedian Steve Way. Steve was born with muscular dystrophy and is a champion for disability rights. He's most recently been in the spotlight starring as himself in the hit Hulu show, Rami. You now have a season two of Rami, congratulations. Thank you. Did you feel like when you read the script that you knew it was going to be golden? I knew it was going to be something special. I knew that people were going to resonate with it and that it was really going to have an impact on people's lives, regardless of their way of life or their religion. And you and Rami are friends in real life, right? Yes. How did the creative process kind of unfold? Well, Rami really wanted to make sure that all my parts were authentic to me. You know, he always tells people that the situations may not be real, but the feelings are, um, you know, the emotions are. So he wanted to make sure that really every little detail was specific to me and to my story. And I think really that's why the show is so good, is because of how authentic it is. Um, for this section, <laughs> I wanted to share with you guys some relatable TikToks that I thought were really funny. And TikTok in itself is also another mode of representation because, you know, it 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 has pros and cons. Um it definitely helped me when I first got diagnosed and it helped me feel seen, but there is also that issue of people misdiagnosing themselves um, and co-opting symptoms. Um, for example, there's this huge thing going on right now. Um, an online discourse where people jokingly say things like, oh, my intrusive thoughts won today, and it's something like impulsively buying $20 earrings, whereas intrusive thoughts are typically associated with obsessive compulsive disorder. So people with obsessive compulsive disorder have truly intrusive thoughts that they don't want to have and does not reflect their actual desire can be things like you 
you're driving and you're like, hmm, what if I swerved into this other lane right now? Or you're like chopping up carrots and you're like, what if I chopped off my finger right now? Um, so there's a lot of co-opting symptoms and saying that something is this certain disability when it's really not and people misdiagnosing themselves so while TikTok is a great way to meet others in your community who you know can share their own experiences and allow you to feel like you're not alone um it's definitely important to seek professional advice and get an official diagnosis um rather than just basing it off of tiktok which is kind of relative to like my millennial experience of like people uh misdiagnosing themselves through like webmd because of hypochondria so um yeah, that was just a little tangent before I play these clips. And here's the first one. See, this is super true because I would be the person on the right. Like, they're just fidgeting the whole time. Whereas the person on the left is barely even moving their body. Um, then there's this next one. Hey, um, can I talk to you about something real quick? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so basically my friends are trying to pla- Wait, do you know who the- Ah, uh, it doesn't really matter, does it? Anyway, so I was trying to say that when your friends are- no, when my friends Hold keep... on, what- I don't even know what you're saying. No, I was just explaining that- Uh, no. So that one's really funny to me because- I find myself doing that a lot where it's kind of like I'm processing my thoughts while I'm speaking so I can't always like have this completed sentence if I you know have a, a thought in the middle of it or have a question in the middle of what I'm saying it kind of turns into like this tree with all these different branches on it so I thought that one was super funny ah this one this one is really important and kind of what I was talking about in terms of like the intrusive thoughts um yeah it's not it's not just like quirky things um this also is related to kind of like the masking thing and um damn so that one it's super important because when I'm experiencing sensory overload, it does make me very irritable because I'm so overwhelmed and frustrated that it'll be easier for me to snap. Um, and I don't think that I'm overall a mean person and it it is hard for me to have to like go on the apology tour after I have like a sensory overload meltdown and you know uh snap at my partner when they ask me a question and I'm just like freaking out right here <laughs> it's me hi I'm the problem it's me I thought that was really funny. 
Hi, can I speak with the CEO of ADHD? This is the CEO of ADHD. How may I help you today? I was wondering if we could get some weighted vests, fidget toys, and other resources made for adults and not just kids since you don't grow out of ADHD when you grow into adulthood. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next. And then this next one, um, also super relatable. Right, and then it... What? Did your clothes offend you? My sweater is uncomfortable. You've been wearing it all day. Yeah, it was okay until it wasn't. How does that work? I don't notice something's bothering me until the feeling builds and hits a sensory threshold, and then suddenly I'm like, get it off me. Oh, kind of like how you go from enjoying a social interaction to wanting to disappear in like a second. Yeah, exactly. That one is also super relatable because sometimes like I'll be wearing one of my favorite hoodies and it's super comforting and then all of a sudden I just feel like super restricted and claustrophobic and I'll have to like take it off and then maybe like five minutes later put it back on and then if it's like a warm classroom I have to take it back off because then I'll get hot so um that was really funny Thank you guys for listening and learning more about sensory overload as well as my own personal experiences with being a neurodivergent person and I hope it was enlightening and entertaining and yeah.